So Max, great to speak with you. Um, you're a really fascinating individual, had a really interesting company in the past. I'd love to just quickly hear your kind of two to three minute rundown who you are and your story. Hi, James. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Max Werner, originally from Germany. Um, pretty much have done um, seven years of active service in the German Federal Armed Forces as an officer. Um, have transitioned my military career into pretty much like the standard business career, switched to consulting, did a PhD in economics as well, and uh, was very, very happy to work on the Hyperloop project for a while during my PhD. I worked together with um, some of the Hyperloop companies in the US and got some very early exposure pretty much like to the uh, American style of deep tech um, and I pretty much this is also what pretty much triggered uh, this this um yeah, this uh, like will in me uh, to work on deep tech uh, myself, uh, having this military background, having seen pretty much the problems that are in the military, every soldier knows them, uh, of the equipment failures of the machines that do not run all of these uh, problems that I'm now very publicly known. Um, and you pretty much combine that with this uh, deep tech uh, approach that the US is uh, pursuing. Uh, that was something that uh, very early in my career triggered uh, that I wanted to found my own uh, defense deep tech company um and yeah now now we are here that's awesome man i mean before we dig into that as well i want to talk about seven years in service i mean you know a lot of people listening won't have had any kind of exposure to that or maybe they had a couple of years so tell me what that was kind of like and uh you know why you stayed in service for so long as well I um, pretty much signed up for like a standard officer career in the German Federal Armed Forces in uh, NBC reconnaissance. Um, so pretty much like working on special types of weapon systems and uh, how to identify them and how to prevent them doing any damage to our troops. Um, I pretty much in Germany, it is uh, a big chunk of the 13 years that you normally sign up to um, is pretty much education that you're really uh, trained as a leader. Um, you get a lot of exposure internationally as well. There's a lot of uh, training elements which are done together with the UK, with France, with the US as well. And um, very early, you get put into leadership positions as well. Um, and uh, that was always something I found very fascinating. I love the military. I love the values they stood for. I love the idea of defending our international order in that sense. Um, and I very early found, uh, found my way and my passion in this. Um, also... Uh, that was something that I wanted to pretty much uh, continue, um, and I had signed up pretty much for 13 years. But in my seventh year, I um, was uh, pretty much in South America uh, on a training mission and uh, had a, quite a bad accident, which pretty much sent me uh, into a one-year uh, therapy. And uh, this pretty much ended my active military career by force. Um, and uh, yeah, this is pretty much why I needed to transition. Um yeah, and I can just say, like, I think the transition worked out quite well um, and because I still stay true to those values and I try to uh, continue them with my legacy. I hope, yeah, I hope there was some kind of a silver lining as well then, um, being able to pivot into yes. tech. Yeah, it's really interesting, man, because I think when I think of the military, obviously, you think discipline, focus and kind of almost obedience to a sense, which almost feels like a 50-50 from what? entrepreneurship is it feels like the complete opposite right so how do you kind of reconcile that how did you find jumping from a probably quite a regimented and strict environment into somewhere where you have to be a lot more creative and think outside of the box that's a very good question i think it's a little bit of a cliche that the militaries pretty much uh, still have these values. I think modern militaries are much more open-minded and led by ideas and vision that most people would expect, actually. Especially like in the German military, we have uh, a special leadership concept, um, which pretty much goes around the idea that you are led by a certain mission, right? Like you are not getting certain tasks and you just need to do them. You are getting pretty much the higher goal and then you figure out yourself how you're pretty much fulfilling that goal. Um, and especially as an officer or a sergeant, um, you're very early in a very similar position than a young entrepreneur. You're giving a challenge, a mission, values, and a team. The only thing that is good, it's pretty much funded already. And then you need to figure out how you do it. And uh, in that sense, it's probably micro exposure to entrepreneurialism, which I found very, very good. And I always felt that uh, during my entrepreneurial career, uh, all the military legacy I had really helped me. It absolutely helped me with my values. Uh, it helped me with my leadership principles. And it did help me with uh, getting shit done. 
Yeah, love it. Because I understand as well the the company that you founded does has kind of an ethics angle to it. It's underpinned by making sure you know whatever you're doing is ethical. Can you explain maybe then how you kind of identified that problem within the military and then took it into an idea that then eventually became a product and a company? Yes, it's very good that you speak about ethics. I think um, I was always puzzled uh, by the idea that the military has in the public kind of a good reputation, right? I mean, in Germany, it's a little bit uh, 50-50 probably, but like in most European countries and in the US, the military has a good standing. Most people on the street would tell you that your soldiers have stayed true to their values, and at least the majority of the soldiers, on average, are, are representatives of, of good values and ethics. Um, and that's something that was absolutely not the case if you ask the same person about the defense industry. The defense industry, those supplying to the same guys who everyone believes has the good values, is normally seen as a little bit dodgy, like uh, doing unethical things, uh, classic mode like selling to both sides in a war. And these kind of cliches are wide, wide represented. And I think because the industry is very intransparent and pretty much hides behind um, corporate communication, it's also something that is not challenged. Uh, and in that regard, everything, everyone who enters pretty much the defense industry is automatically met with this kind of societal preconditioning of um, having a problem with their ethics and morals. Um, nevertheless, I do think that um, change is coming already. There's a new wave of defense startups. Uh, mine has been one of them. But there's a lot of great other defense startups out there who are doing things right and uh, bring the right values to the table and challenge the existing precondition of the industry. No, fantastic. And then I'd love to hear kind of in a bit more detail then how you kind of square that off and, you know, what your product is and how it helps uh, promote better ethics. Yes. Yeah, now comes the controversial part. Like uh, the product pretty much that we have developed is um, in the end like a uh, weaponized small drone. Um, so in the end, um, we saw a problem um, and the problem pretty much that the NATO has and most militaries worldwide even um, is the so-called first man problem. Um, so pretty much every time a soldier or policeman pretty much enters a door or goes up a staircase or goes around a corner, there's a risk, of course, that there's an ambush plan on the other side. And uh, if you are in uncontrolled territory, you need to make sure that that is controlled, right? Because you want to make sure that uh, you are in charge of that area. Um, and in that sense, the first man is equipped pretty much to put either cover fire into the room or to control the area so the other guys can come in and stabilize the room's condition. And this position, being the first man, is the deadliest uh, in the NATO and in the whole world, pretty much, uh, being a soldier. Um, because you are very likely to be shot or to at least get a scratch or some some injury um, and the wounded to kill uh, statistics that are sometimes published as well by the u.s military show that um, this position is even deadlier than being an infantryman and at d-day um, it's really an absolutely horrendous problem that we still have we still see in ukraine today as well uh, first men are happening all the time and even the police uh, uh, experiences the first man position the idea that we had pretty much was to um, substitute a soldier through a robot that could do the same job. Because having a reconnaissance robot or a reconnaissance drone is good, but it doesn't change that you still need to go into that room. You need to secure it. It is always the same problem. Um, and the only way how you can secure that room is by putting fire into that room. And that is something that is controversial. I can, we can understand that, I can understand that, but it is the nature of what is done there. And I think in that sense, we just need to accept the status quo. This is how it is today. And we need to very carefully plan that the status quo by new inventions is improved in the sense that, is it maybe more precise? Is it less shooting? Is it um, less wounded and killed ratio on our side, on all sides in the ideal world? Um, and that's always how I measured ethics in that sense. Accepting the status quo reality, don't be ignorant about that it does exist and trying to solve the problem in that sense. And um, how we came up with a solution pretty much for us to um, put um, a weapon system on a small drone. Uh, the problem with a small drone shooting is the recall. As soon as you are in indoor environments, if, as soon as you want to fly through a window, the drone needs to have a certainly small size in order to work. And the first man scenario is pretty much always indoor. So you need to have a small drone 
that small drone has a limited payload due to the size. Um, that's just the nature of physics. And uh, as soon as you shoot pretty much on a small drone, um, pretty much like the recall has a massive impact. It either takes the drone out by the, the vibrations that go through the system, or it pretty much mitigates the, the precision. So you actually have more injury as well. And uh, the patented system that we invented was pretty much like um, a rocket engine on the back of that drone, which pretty much was uh, fired around the same time uh, in order to compensate for that recoil uh, and to make sure that the system can shoot precisely and avoid shooting the wrong person and hopefully only shooting once. Uh, and that's pretty much what was our main invention um, and what we developed uh, in, the, in the past seven years Yeah. That's awesome, Matt. There's so much to unpack there as well. I'm just thinking off the top of my head, there must have been some kind of computer vision angle to detect, you know, insurgents or, you know, people in a room. Um, I'm just thinking as well, you know, kind of if you go into a room and there's a threat of, you know, a dangerous individual with a with a weapon or something like that, there may also be kind of non-dangerous individuals in there. And you you almost not only want to protect the first man, but also kind of, you know, avoid as much as possible human error. So kind of how did you approach that problem of, you know, even this drone might even shoot kind of the wrong person? And in the end, it's always going back to the status quo, right? Like the status quo as we have it today is that this first man goes into the room and puts cover fire into the room, which means there is a risk already, actually a horrendous risk that someone is wounded who should not be wounded. Um, and this risk pretty much is especially there because the first man targeting operation, making sure that he hits the right person, is dramatically influenced by his own will to not be wounded, right? Because he's under fire and he needs to do precision shooting. So ultimately, taking the human out of that loop, or at least in the, in the position where he is under fire to take that shot, is the first step where you actually improve the status quo. It's the first step. The second step that you are doing this is by pretty much um, our drone had um, a number of camera systems on board, which helped with the targeting of the system. So the drone was automatically targeting. Automatically targeting doesn't mean automatically firing. The firing decision was 100% protected on a second system um, to be with the human and soldiers who are pretty much in safety on the same and the other side of the room. So they are in safety, they cannot be wounded, so they can make the same decision as the first man, just in a safer scenario. And they can still see the same thing that a soldier would see in that area and would make um, the same decision, uh, just under less pressure and therefore less rate of error. Um, and of course, that means you reduce the risk to the, um, the other side uh, and you are dramatically reducing the risk to the first man as well. Fantastic, yeah. So you're basically replacing um, the whole need for you know soldiers to be put in risk uh, by sending you know drones ahead of time, yeah. Because as we as we mentioned before as well, I've seen it in kind of more civilian applications. You know, any kind of you know uh, what's what's the word um, like house arrest, like people holding or hostages even in like a building, um, and kind of sending a drone in there firsthand to protect the police officers. I think you have a different group of people in the background, maybe a few streets away, away from the danger, actually monitoring this, the situation, and they can pull um, the no-go, no decision, so to speak, from a distance. So it's not all automated, and you're not kind of putting life and death into the hands of just AI or a robot, which is uh, makes a lot of sense. In that sense, I think we are still far away from where pretty much an AI would make that decision. And I'm very happy about that. Like, I think that's something which as long as possible should be in the hands of, of humans. And I think there's also a number of initiatives from by the UN, I think, um, that are pretty much uh, preventing uh, that AI decision-making is put uh, exclusively into the hand of, of, of computers. I think that when it comes to ethics, there needs to be a human in the loop. That's, I think, very important. In that sense, we always saw our product as an avatar, much more as a fully functional autonomous robot. I mean, that's almost where the world of work is headed, right? I mean, we're all just kind of supported by AI. AI is giving us superpowers, is making us more productive. But the vast majority of people I've spoken to will say that it's never really going to fully replace humans. Um, and it will simply be there to support us. Yeah. And you, you're in the yeah. same camp as well? Yeah. I do think there are some jobs which probably everyone accepts would be good to be fully optimized and they might be just without any big risk uh, can be optimized as well. But uh, there are questions, of course, of like joblessness and like uh, keeping, making sure that we have enough jobs left afterwards. Uh, there's a lot to, to unpack there, but I think I should focus on, on my area because I don't want to pretend to be an expert on others. 
Although it's great to just pontificate and throw ideas around as well. I think it's, um, from my point of view, I think it's one of those situations, you know, when the PC came along, I'm too young to remember it personally, but supposedly, you know, there was a huge kind of wipe out of jobs and roles and, you know, people over, over time adapt and the ones who kind of adapt to the new technology go ahead and the ones that let it drop fall behind. So AI does feel like that really kind of tectonic shift over the last kind of six months or so. And time will tell, but I think it will be a case of... um you know, which ones can use AI to advantage the ones that are going to last as well. I think ultimately as well, until we get this, you know, supposed AGI, all of all of the AI models are biased anyway. They're all running on some kind of human bias. There's been some human input, you know, whether it be the initial feedstock data, whether it be someone, you know, applying the finishing touches to the decision making, there is that human bias in there as well. And that's not going to go anytime soon. If the training data is pretty much not neutral, right? Like, I mean, every data that we are currently training on always has a bias towards whoever has provided that training data. It's the same, by the way, with um, pretty much like drones and autonomous flight, right? If you fly in a certain area and you train the drone um, pretty much to fly in dark conditions that mimic our houses, then it will be able to perform better in these same conditions. But as soon as you put it into the desert or like um, somewhere in the jungle, will dramatically drop in performance because, of course, it wasn't trained on that kind of data. So that's always a very important consideration, which sometimes is uh, left behind on the whole AI discussion. I think that reminds me of autonomous vehicles as well. You have a similar problem, um, particularly kind of, you know, when you had that rush of news about, oh, AVs are finally here and you can drive autonomously and it's like, well, you've only been trained on, you know, a couple of square miles in Phoenix, Arizona, and you're not ready to go out on the full roads and they've just kind of learned the way around in a, in a confined area. I think that's exactly true. Um, but going back to your company as well, I'd love to hear kind of, I've seen it described as software-driven hardware, which is a term that I've seen before. Can you kind of unpack that term and what it means? So pretty much like, one thing that we were implementing was a safeguarding on the shooting mechanism. So we pretty much like wanted to um, experiment with the idea um, that the shooting would be restricted based on the rules of engagement that were set for that area of war. So in any war, you normally, especially the NATO, set uh, certain uh, rules of engagement, which pretty much uh, define what is allowed and what is not allowed. And we wanted to experiment with the idea that our drone would enforce or has the Option to enforce these kind of rules of engagement by pretty much understanding what it sees and how it is used. Um, and that's something that we saw as a big potential in order to pretty much um, control the hardware uh, with a safeguarding on software and ultimately change the status quo of potential misuse um, that other weapon systems are having out there. And, it, and it's... Um... We can get onto fundraising, you know, whether you raise from investors as well. But I understand that's what an investor would look for as well in a deep tech startup. Is like, you know, how quickly can you iterate? How quickly can you adapt and change the software? And you know, essentially change your kind of offering in the same way that a B two B SaaS app might do as well on a quick turnaround, um, such that you can kind of better fit the needs of customers. And in your case, you know, make it perform in a more ethical manner. So again, coming back to the training data, like uh, I think one thing that we were a little bit concerned about or what we raised with uh, our customers was that it's really important that these kind of restrictions and the AI models are trained on data, which is still run by humans. Because if we wait too long and the automation goes forward and we do have some systems which will do this by themselves, then the training data from them is not having the small millisecond delay that the human would probably take on certain decisions and that we want to keep right because that's the ethical moments that we speak about and i think it's really really important to um especially like we see as well a lot of dummy data that is just generated by robots and like for like uh, enabling the, the, the to to ease the training this is very dangerous because that has possibly like a shortfall of these human elements that we still need in order to make the right ethical decisions no, absolutely. That's fantastic. And then can you talk maybe about kind of, obviously you have a background in the military, so I imagine it wasn't too hard as a kind of inside man to, you know, get your first customers and to get traction. Can you shed light onto what that process was like? And as you kind of alluded to, you know, how how you kind of got customer feedback and took that back to your product and, and iterated? 
It's a really funny story, actually. Like, um, so we started in 2016, back in the day. Um, in 2016, like the whole project Maven and Google, the revolt of like not working for defense uh, just started and Palantir was shifting around to, to actually pick up Project Maven. So in the US, this all picked up as well. Back in 2016, there were not many defense startups and we pretty much did the same thing. So the infrastructure doesn't didn't exist much yet. Um, so everything that we now see with Diana and everything didn't exist at the time. And um, so the first contact, the German military at the time still had um, a political veto on weaponized drones. So whole Germany couldn't procure weaponized drones, which was also for me because I came from Germany, the reason why I came over to the UK. Uh, UK actually was far ahead uh, when it came to innovation and working with startups. They had pretty much a whole infrastructure set up, multiple um, points of contact where startups could work with them. Um, we were welcomed with ease, to be honest. Like We spoke with them, we introduced the idea, we um, showcased pretty much an early prototype quite quickly quickly this was all very well organized i always felt that the military in the uk had a really good standing when it came to innovation and how they picked it up um also funding was yeah it wasn't the best if you compare it to commercial but it still was there it was good funding it it, was, it didn't take took too long and um i think this has even improved now so i think we always hear like a lot of like um, especially in the media complaints about the procurement cycles in defense that's true they do take their time but i think at least they're reliable and uh, as long as you have investors who are pretty much understanding of these procurement cycles that's really really important um then everything will go well um, but the challenge pretty much is to have investors who understand them because like defense doesn't work like a curve which most startups do right like you're just seeing a curve where it pretty much gets more and more like procurement pretty much in defense goes nothing 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 at that big so and this thing pretty much before is called the valley of death which you pretty much need to discuss with your investors before you start a defense company and um at the moment, we see a lot of this um, dual-use applications, of course, which pretty much is already implemented by most of the NATO militaries, which tell them, look, do have, please, applications for your product which are not only military, because they know that the valley of death, most companies die. So in that period, they want you to pretty much sell to commercial so you survive to get the big contract at the end. Um, that is something that I understand why they do it, but I think it doesn't work for some types of startups, especially weapon innovation, because weapon innovation by nature has a very limited dual use application. It still is needed, um, but yeah, it's it's a little bit more complex than this. It this is still of, a gap in the market at the moment. It kind of flies in the face of traditional entrepreneurial advice in terms of you know finding your niche and drilling down and solving a very specific problem for a set of companies. And then you have investors turning around and saying, um, yeah, it's cool all the stuff you're doing over there, but you know, what's the commercial aspect? I don't want you to just play around in the military. But it's interesting, the, po uh, the point you make about UK. I think there's a lot of criticism, as you said, leveled not just the military, but kind of the wider deep tech ecosystem in the UK about how we have so much kind of innovation coming out of universities and labs. And you actually look at a lot of the progress has been made in things like biotech and hardware over the last 10, 20 years has actually come and originated from the UK, quantum computing and all of these kind of things. Um, but we just lack, so, this is something missing there. It's that bridge between the kind of labs and the commercialization. It's the lack of kind of investor knowledge in these sectors. Um, so I think you make a fantastic point about investors, you know, if you're going to invest in something more hardware and deep tech and um, military focus, for example, you must have deep expertise in it. It's not something you can just kind of dabble, dabble in. And also, like, of course, this is pretty much my own opinion, um, so be used with, with care. Um, but ultimately, I do believe um, there needs a lot of tech startups do not do their market research very well. Um, they do have very good inventions and the tech is really cool, um, but normally their competitive landscape is too hard and they underestimate their market gap. Um, I think a lot of them want to just compete and think they will outperform something which is already 80% of their product and that's just not what the market will pay for, right? If you are not really filling a market gap where there's ideally no one, like really no one, then it's really, really hard to um, yeah, do hardware and gain the investor trust and uh, also convince the government because the government doesn't trust the same, right? They take a look like who are your competitive landscape and 
of course, if, if there's only one small startup, then the primes will probably do it better, right? So like, it needs to be really convincing. It really needs to be something new and novel. And it not only new and novel with a one pound application, it needs to be new and novel with a one to $3 billion application. That's really rare. And I think that's something that is always underestimated. And I think uh, that always backfires at, in, the, in the areas of series A, B, and B. No, 100%. Yes, fantastic advice. Um, almost don't take the dive unless you've ticked those kind of things off um, would be the advice there. Really have a look at the market and read some economics books of like how markets work, how competitive dynamics work. That is really baseline stuff that a founder should have. Is that why, you, just, is that why you yourself, you know, when did your PhD in economics? Was it that kind of, that desire and needed to learn more about the area? Since I was just very lucky that I had it and I had a little bit of an understanding, but it allowed me to track it over time and see pretty much the problems evolving. Uh, and I didn't do everything right. Of course, I did a shit ton of stuff wrong. Um, but like that was something that helped me to understand what I did wrong, at least on the economics and the market side. And that um, is something I'm happy to share here. Yeah, fact, I'd love to hear more. I'd love to hear just kind of, particularly with deep tech and hard te hardware startups, what are the common roadblocks that people uh, will encounter and how can they kind of mitigate the risk of running into them? You know, how, how can they front load that risk and, you know, avoid, as you said, in kind of series A and B running into these problems down the line? Always the difference between prototype and products is probably a really big one as well, right? Like building a first prototype is probably... 5% or maybe 2% of your total funding needs. Like uh, the prototype is easy to do. Like it's important to do it quickly in order to gain traction and secure your market share. But uh, the real challenge and where really the funding and the corporate stuff comes in, where you need to evolve as a founder and as a business is as soon as you are going to product. Like ultimately product requires discipline. It requires where like um, a lot of pretty much procedures need to be implemented in the business. All the cool stuff at the beginning where everything is vibing and partying is changing a little bit to yeah, a little bit of a normal job, right? Like, and it's a little bit more boring, um, but it does help dramatically, of course, to be commercialized. And um, that is something that is really hard. And I, I just want to double down. If you enjoy building the prototypes, that's a good thing, but make sure that you either complement yourself with a co-founder who also enjoys building the procedures because then you will need it down the line, um, or you have an idea of how you will change yourself or educate. No, it's absolutely fantastic advice. Um, are these kind of, you know, as you as you alluded to, are these problems that you found along your own journey or are these kind of, are some of these, you know, you can get book smart on or is it simply a case of, you know, you have to jump into the deep end and learn as you grow? I think um, if you want to do the entrepreneurial journey, I think you cannot learn anything ahead anyway. I think it's really good the earlier you did it. Um, uh, ultimately, I just want to encourage everyone the younger you are to start that journey, the better it is. It is a long journey. Um, and uh, ultimately, if you have two fails and the third one is going to succeed, that's still a really good career, right? Like, And uh, in that sense, uh, I just want to double down. I think everyone who has graduated from from any university and has some, some level of knowledge and understanding of the subject matter can, in theory, do the job of an entrepreneur. I don't see any, any hurdles there. What is really important is to keep that balance between pretty much the tech development itself, the ability to sell it, that's really important as well, and of course, to fundraise. And ultimately, I think this web always becomes a little bit tricky, especially with tech people, is by cliche at least, um, it's not, not the case for everyone, of course. It's like this, uh, the, the, the ability to sell stuff. Like you need to sell pretty much everything all the time, your product, your company, and yourself um, and uh, your team. Everything needs to be sold all the time. And uh, as soon as you stop selling pretty much, the business stops existing, especially like in the first let's say, 24 months. Um, so you need to be the visionary, right? Like you need to be the one who always believes in everything. Even if stuff is hard, of course, there are some days where everything goes very wrong. You think it will not work, uh, but you still need to sell it. Um, that's really, really hard work. And how about, obviously, kind of the software founder is able to maybe get traction in a couple of weeks or months, you know, and, you know, turn over there, write a new bit of code in over a weekend and kind of send something out you to a... a to a customer and obviously in hardware you generally can't do things like that and as we've established you know the turnaround times are a lot longer 
how do you kind of reconcile that as a founder? How do you how do you kind of go into a new venture knowing that maybe even for kind of three, four, five years you won't see any revenue? Um, and how do you remain focused on your goal during that kind of that time? Like I, I do understand what you're saying, but I have personally not experienced it. I was very lucky that um, pretty much working with the military provided a constant stream of revenue because they fund pretty much hardware development, right? Like, I mean, not everything, of course, it's not fully covered, but uh, there are during the whole period of development, there's uh, pretty much exchange with customers, there's funding. Um, so like working with the military in hardware, I always found a very, very um, encouraging thing to do. Um, and it got very, well rewarded in that sense. Yeah, uh, really also, fun. I just want to double down on saying, like with hardware, you have one massive advantage as well. It's way cooler to showcase everything and to sell it, right? Like to sell hardware to an investor is so much easier than software because it's uh, just by like, you can touch it, you can feel it. Like, of course, like leaving aside software focused investors, but like if you have a neutral investor, hardware is just so much easier to sell. They can see it, they can touch it. It helps dramatically. Yeah, I remember I went to a, a deep tech event last year and there were kind of all these stands set up, right? And, you know, various kind of quantum computing and kind of, you know, more black box technologies are quite hard to understand, wrap your head around, maybe some VR stuff. And there was one guy with like, I've had him on the pod actually a few months ago uh, who had just a robot in farming automation. And it was like such a nice little prototype. I think like kind of one fifth scale, one tenth scale. And immediately my curiosity coming from an engineering background, I just like, I saw the wheels and the cogs and the mechanics. And I was like, I've got his three for that. Right. And you just, and it unpacks a whole different, just kind of seeing that something that's tangible and physical that you can kind of comprehend how it might work in the real world and isn't some kind of code under the surface. I hundred percent agree with you there. And I think it's also really important. The point you made about, um, you know, how you were able to find funding due to your military startup. I think there's two really key points for any listeners and founders, which is the first that you had deep experience and the connections in the space. So you weren't kind of going blind into a new industry. You weren't kind of thinking, like, oh, how do I even find the right people? How do I fundraise? You know, having to learn the problems from the ground up because you'd worked there for, you know, on, getting on for a decade. Uh, and the second would be that you're actually kind of, you're being fundraised by your customers, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I think that's a that's a key thing for, um, for hardware founders as well to actually strike up partnerships or relationships with your potential customers as quickly as possible, even if, even if it's kind of LOIs um, and draft contracts that you may eventually sell a product in the future, but actually get into that network as early as possible. Uh, just to say, say one side note as well, like the military looks for this stuff anyway, right? Like they are very easy to deal with. Like I think you don't need a big um, experience or uh, network in the military to work with them like ultimately just reach out to them introduce your product they're always interested like uh, i think there is no no conflict or like no uh, hesitation on the military side like absolutely even if you've never been in the military they want to hear from your your tech innovation no absolutely i mean as we kind of mentioned before typically a lot of kind of tech innovation hardware innovation comes in the military and then it trickles down to consumer over time is there any obviously a kind of you know, don't want to put you on the spot or make you reveal anything, but is there any kind of really interesting advanced technology that is in the military right now that might have potential commercial applications to the extent that you're happy to share, of course? I think probably like a lot of stuff that's currently ongoing, like, like um, in the sense of like force field generation. Uh, I do know that like um, there are some contracts that the US military has um, that are purely defense, of course, uh, around force fields, um, especially they are like bomb protection at the moment, uh, laser defense, uh, that's very interesting. Um, and I think uh, these kind of applications are super useful, of course, like in the normal life, right? Because what does force, will force fields will do? They will be used in space ultimately for us to travel in space and not uh, experience debris anymore, for example, protect our satellites from laser attacks. So there's, I think, a lot of interesting stuff around that area. Um, yeah, but I'm not the technical expert to dig it too much into the details there, but uh, it is an area that I find very, very fascinating. It's amazing. Yeah, we're living in sci-fi now. It's like all the kind of sci-fi movies you grew up in. Star Trek, like, Force Field's already there. Like, it's yeah, really like Star Wars yeah. and like all of this AI stuff as well. I mean, like things like Minority Report, even 20 years ago, is now becoming a reality. It's absolutely crazy. 
Um, but yeah, I, this, I'm fascinated by all this stuff, all this futuristic technology. I, I can tell you are as well. I understand, obviously, you're clearly a very curious person and you like to like, read about new things and expand your learning. Like, what has you interested at the moment? Is there any technology, you know, even stuff that you that kind of industries or, you know, stuff you're reading at the moment that's grabbed your interest? I'd love to hear. Yes, I mean, funny enough, like it's it's probably like in the area of um, pretty much like what is ongoing with um, private militaries. There's a lot going on in that area, and uh, that's an area where pretty much innovation hasn't reached it yet. Um, so they are still in very anarchical structures, um, and I think um, that kind of business model also needs to be questioned with a more moral approach. And that's something I'm currently looking into. Oh, fantastic. And then if we come back to your company as well, briefly, kind of, you, you got acquired. Is that why you made the exit um, by an industry player, as I understand? Tell me, like, kind of, give me the insight into whether that was your plan from the start and then kind of how that came about and why you decided, like, that time was the right time to pull the trigger and sell. It's uh, sadly not 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 a success story in that sense. It is an exit, but it wasn't a successful exit. So what pretty much happened is that um, we experienced the Corona pandemic, as I think everyone else did. Um, and in that sense, like also military procurement stopped. Um, we worked with uh, a number of other NATO militaries. Um, all of this stopped during the uh, lockdowns, um, and uh, we were just heading um, build our production line, our first one, which means our our burn, uh, cash burn was very high. Um, we just delivered pretty much the first batch to one of our customers. Uh, and at that time, pretty much we were due to close um, a significant funding round, um, which pretty much one of our investors jumped off due to the economic situation, how the markets developed during pandemic. Um, so we very found it very, very hard um, to quickly find an investor during the pandemic, which would also work with a venture and a weapon developer. Again, this triangle of like being a venture weapon developer is really, really rare to fund. Uh, and in that sense, we spoke with a lot. Um, we did found one at the end, uh, but when we found one, uh, pretty much we already run beyond our cash burns. So we were pretty much broke at that time. Um, so the company was pretty much in uh, administration at the time. Um, and uh, the new buyer uh, didn't offer to invest anymore, but to, to pretty much buy out the IP and assets and some of the team. Um, and that's something that we did pretty much with a roughly six month delay. Um, so it was a very, very ugly end to this project. Um, and uh, then everything was merged with a company that was in the portfolio of that investor as well. Yeah, I'm sure there are a lot of similar stories out there. Yeah, just the unfortunate kind of market timing and everything. So in terms of the customers, you know, and I'd love to hear your insight to kind of like what kind of multiple and stuff like that that these companies sell for, you know, whether they go to typically go to private equity or if they go to kind of, you know, the BA, BAE systems of the world. Um, yeah. The number of offers before the actual exit during the pretty much the cash constraints and the multiples there were very nice. I mean, I can't complain on that at all. Like we did raise for like 10x uh, funding and that was really good. Like as you would expect it as a commercial company that was also existent and capable uh, for our hardware defense, even weapon company, which of course has a much smaller market, but that much smaller market had much less competition as well. And that devaluation kind of was reflecting. Um, so yeah, there was a number of investors who were on the valuation, there was never a problem. Um, and uh, we had two takeover offers from Primes as well at the time, and all of them were in very good dimensions. Um, so if we would have sold before Corona, but no one expected that we would end at that time, that's why we rejected all of them. Um, but yeah, that would have been much better. Yeah, 100%. And it seems like... Um... Are you kind of, you know, waiting on the sidelines right now for your next, you know, entrepreneurial venture? Um, what are you up to at the moment? You know, what have you got your sights set on for the next uh, couple of years? It's, I think it's a little bit of a cliche, but it's, it's similar to a marriage. Like if you're ultimately divorcing, like you need some time to actually settle with all of this stuff. Like if you have a dirty exit, um, it's, it's, it's something that really uh, brings some some non-pleasant experiences to the table as well. I want to speak about this as well because like a lot of entrepreneurs will experience this as well and no one talks about it. So it's not a shame, like it's perfectly fine. Again, a lot of people experience this and the only thing that is important is to take yourself time and pick yourself up um, and take the time as well. Like uh, do not immediately found your new startup because then you will just have 
something that is not really thought through, that doesn't have a really good product market fit, which doesn't have the market gap in order to do it because you just want to try to get in again. That's not wise. Give yourself some time. Um, look for a job in the meantime uh, that suits you, even if it's a little bit difficult to adjust after the founder experience. But then once you feel right again, then everything should be should be going up back to speed with all the experience you've gathered. You will dramatically accelerate as well and will be successful, more successful than you have been before, which is my plan as well. But I do not know when that will happen. Now, of course, time will tell, right? Wait for the right moment. I think it's... um. You know, it's important that particularly if you're entrepreneurial and you're creative to avoid that kind of shiny object syndrome, which you've kind of alluded to, which is not going straight back into the game or trying to jump on a trend that you think, you know, you, you, you can capitalize on right now, but actually to bide your time. Um, and then kind of leading on from the points you made, then if you reflect on your own entrepreneurial journey, kind of what were your biggest takeaways from it? And what would you have done differently, if anything? ways where probably like the team experience i think for myself like i did um, really feel like building a team like this where you work that intensely together especially like at the beginning of a startup journey like at the end we were like 65 people um, and it was very enjoyable it was something that really um yeah changed my life and that managed the connections that i've made and the people i've met as part of the startup journey it's probably the most valuable thing of, of the whole project. Um, and uh, what I would change? Um, not much, to be honest. I think it sounds a little bit arrogant, and I sometimes ask myself that question. Um, but I do think that the corona pandemic in the end was a black swan event, which um, has triggered a lot of business failure. And I think... Um, yeah, black swan events are really hard to plan for, right? So it's it's not a natural thing. And um, in that sense, I would have not made a lot of different choices uh, looking back at it at the moment. Yeah, you gave it your all. And um, the, the factors that determined the the end were kind of external. So I completely understand that. And then you, you just said you kind of managed, you were basically managing 65 people, which is actually a lot of, it's a, it's a large number of people. I mean, rarely do we have Kind of do I talk to software companies that have that many people just because of the nature of software? Um, and if they do, it's you know seventy percent sales team, which you're all sure they can kind of cut out at some point. Um, what was that like, kind of managing such a number of people? Um, you know, was it hard to kind of coordinate all the different departments? You know, what was it like dealing with like firing and stuff like that? Uh, do you see yourself generally as a people person as well? Does it come naturally to you? Because I've sp- kind of spoken to some people who have the idea of I want to get down on my own and like work in a small team and you know work on my vision and this and that. And the kind of more people you hire, the messier it gets? Or do you kind of have a different viewpoint to that? I think this is also probably connected to the prototype versus product experience. Like during the prototype journey, you want to have a very, very small team, very lean to get very quickly to certain results that are just hacked in order to get a contract and get pretty much like on the level where you can raise funding to build everything for production. But on production, pretty much you, by nature, you need more people in order to implement all these procedures and for hardware as well to reach the quality levels and the quality assurance levels. That's really important for the military as well. Uh, And that's something which, of course, comes with a lot of challenges because it also implements new teams which have a completely different mindset, which is pretty much completely the opposite of what the initial team would have had because of the nature of work that they need to do. Um, And that needs to be managed. It's absolutely um, scheduled for conflicts. And I think it's something that has been talked about in many other talks as well. Um, uh, But yeah, that is something hard to manage. I agree. Um, Nevertheless, I always liked it. I always enjoyed it. I always had fun meeting all of these people. And yes, of course, you sometimes split with some of uh, the team. But uh, again, that's rarely personal like uh, because most of the time sometimes even if the skill set doesn't match that doesn't mean that that person is a bad person they just didn't were not fit for that job and this role at the moment um yeah so and being a people person i think sometimes it's a matter of like uh, uh someday you are a people person sometimes not right sometimes it's really a part of the mood as well um yeah but no i love the I really did. And this is so relatable. It's so relatable in terms of some days I want to go out, I want to jump on 50 calls, I want to go out to dinner, I want to meet people. And other days, like, please leave me alone. I'm not picking up my phone, I'm focusing on whatever the task is I had there. Um, but obviously, when you're running a 65 person company, you don't have that luxury to be able to kind of switch on and off when you, when you please. 
really, really um, the lovely head of HR um, who pretty much implemented a really cool policy that we would wear like um, pretty much like uh, arm wrists, which were color coded um, and depended on what color code you had. You uh, pretty much told people if you want to be spoken with or if you want to be uh, like uh, have chit chat or anything else. Um, so that always helped, like especially open open um, larger offices as well with larger teams, because then you can immediately see who is open for a coffee chat or whatever and who just wants to do deep work, right? Because at some point, once you are beyond the 30 people, uh, you need to make sure that people are not distracted and can actually work in an office as well. While at the same time, you want to entertain those who want to be entertained. No, absolutely. You're full of so much advice, man. Are you, um, you understand you're consulting right now. In what area, kind of, what what are you advising on? I have worked pretty much like over the last year with uh, um, Axel Springer, which is like a German media company. And I've worked with the strategy team there as a principal. So I've advised German companies on, on strategy and uh, especially growth strategies. Um, and now I'm working uh, at a British um, defense AI company. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Because I was thinking, you know, on the side, do you do any kind of like mentoring for hardware companies? Do you do any kind of um, angel investing or anything along those lines? Check with uh, some of them, and I'm always happy to connect with founders uh, and investors as well. Like it's it's very interesting to speak with them. Um, and, and if anyone from this talk wants to discuss an idea or reach out, I'm more than happy to provide my advice and just uh, have a conversation as well. Absolutely. I think the most important thing I want to double down on that again: do your research on the competitors and your market cap. Cannot stress this hard enough. This is probably the biggest. Thing that really kills a lot of good tech companies. Although the tech was good, like the market was already used or it's too late. Like in my mind, like all these university accelerator programs, they should have a filter in there, which does a really deep, um, pretty much landscape check in order to avoid these companies coming beyond pretty much the university accelerator. Sadly, no. they don't because they need to fulfill their numbers. But um, yeah, that should be <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing. I think sometimes you get kind of a PhD and a professor who've been working on a problem for 10 years, that um, kind of living and married to the tech. I see all the time with devs. I have a lot of friends who are developers and you kind of, they 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 churn out these little project after project and never really gets any kind of level of commercialization because they're so married to the tech. And I think there's some echoing there with, you know, more scientific, um, deep science, deep tech founders as well, just kind of getting in their own little bubble and focusing on their problem and not getting their head above water and thinking, how big is my market? How can I commercialize? Who are my customers going to be? Why am I better than the competition? I think you made fantastic points. Well, great. Uh, Max, it's been an absolute pleasure. Really interesting conversation. Love the company. And you're clearly very um, kind of dedicated and charismatic individual. Um, are there any kind of points you wanted to finish on? I already made my statement with the uh, economics market gap. Um, yeah, it was an absolute pleasure to to be here on the podcast. Thanks for taking the time as well. And uh, again, if anyone wants to reach out, I'm always happy to talk. Thanks so much, Max. Take care.